to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians, Paul began to answer the question of whether or not the Corinthian believers were allowed to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And while he explained that many of them understood that an idol really was nothing, he also acknowledged the fact that not everyone among them held to that conviction. He would go on to exhort them to be willing to set aside their own rights out of regard for their weaker brethren. And in chapter 9, which we're about to study this morning, Paul gives us an example of one way in which he had done much the same thing himself. You see, it's not just a question of what our rights are or what our liberty is in Christ, but there's also the question of our responsibilities, yes? Because rights, as we know, come with responsibilities. They are not, do, they are not separate from one another. With, with rights come responsibilities. And so Paul, after having said in verse 12 and 13 of chapter 8, when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience as you sin against Christ, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Paul has said, look, we know that an idol is nothing. It doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. There's only one God and everything that is was made through him or for, from everything that was made came from him and everything that was made came through Christ, right? So, so we know that an idol is nothing and, and if a piece of of meat has been sacrificed to an idol, it hasn't changed that meat, and eating that meat will not change me. For as Jesus taught, it's not that which goes into a man that defiles him, but that which comes out of a man, right? But Paul goes on to say not everyone recognizes that. For some people, to eat meat sacrificed to an idol violates their conscience, and for them, it would be a sin, even if for you, who recognizes that the idol is just a piece of stone, it, it doesn't violate your conscience. But Paul is making the point that, okay, that having been said, I am not going to demand my rights and to exercise my liberties in such a way that I'm causing my brother to stumble. I'll give you an example. My grandmother, when I was growing up, was a Seventh-day Adventist. And she was a very devout woman, a very devout Seventh-day Adventist, woman, one of the godliest women I ever knew. She was the one who taught me first what it really meant to pray and how God could hear us even when we didn't speak aloud, but that he knew our thoughts. You know, I remember sitting on her lap as she opened her King James Bible and read to me the stories of Jonah and the whale and Daniel in the lion's den and Daniel and the giant, right? Or David and the giant. I remember those stories as she would read those to me. But I also recognize that, that she was very, very observant of certain religious laws, if you will. And keeping the Sabbath day was of such importance to her that she would not so much as turn on her television on a Saturday, right? She, she would not, even if it was religious programming that she was going to watch, she would not flip the switch on that TV because the Sabbath was to be a day of rest and television had no part in that for her. That was a very strong conviction on her behalf. Now, I, as a child and as an adult, felt that I had the liberty to watch television on Saturdays. In fact, I had two grandmothers who were both observant believers. One was the Seventh-day Adventist grandma, my paternal grandmother that I just mentioned. The other uh, was my mom's mom, my, my maternal grandmother, and she was Pentecostal. So I had one grandmother who was Seventh-day Adventist and the other who was Pentecostal. And sometimes I would go to church with my Seventh-day Adventist grandmother on Saturday, and sometimes I would go to church with my Pentecostal grandmother on Sunday. And as a child, I preferred going with my Pentecostal grandmother on Sunday because that meant I could watch Saturday morning cartoons. <laughs> that was my entire motivation. So clearly, I felt the liberty, even as a child, but certainly as an adult, once I came to understand the truth of the gospel, right? Once I was born again, I felt complete and total liberty to watch television on a Saturday. It did not hurt my conscience in any way, shape, or form, right? But 
even as an adult, if I were staying at my grandmother's house, I would not walk into her living room on a Saturday morning and turn on the TV. Why? I have the liberty to watch TV on a Saturday. Why shouldn't I? Well, because doing so would cause her to stumble, right? And so out of deference to her or out of love for her, I would choose to not exercise my liberty in that way. Does not exercising that liberty mean that I don't have that liberty? No, it simply meant that my love and respect for her would impact my behavior because I would care more about her than I did about my own rights. Amen? And so Paul is going to give a very similar example here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And he begins with a rhetorical question in which he says, am I not an apostle? The obvious answer to that question is what? Yes, he was an apostle. To be an apostle, capital A, right, meant that you were sent by God through Jesus Christ. And the requirement was, according to their outline, you had to have had a, 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 uh, a, an encounter with the living Christ. Because you weren't just telling someone about something you heard. You were telling someone what you had seen, right? And so Paul on the road to Damascus, and we believe from scripture even afterwards, had an encounter with the risen Christ. And so Paul says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? In other words, don't I have liberty? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. You are my, the seal, Paul says, you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. Paul is saying, listen, other people might deny that, I, they might say, oh, that Paul, no, he's not an apostle. He says, look, you are evidence of my apostleship. He said, you know Jesus because of my testimony. You are a church because God used me to plant that church. So even if you would argue that I wasn't sent to anybody else, you can't deny the fact that I was sent to you because I am the one who founded that church there in Corinth, Paul is saying. So Paul is, is stating the fact that I am an apostle and you are my work in the Lord. Now, in verse three, he says, my defense to those who examine me is this. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? So he's going to offer about five different examples or five different arguments in the context of the next 14 verses where he gives example after example after example that demonstrate not only his own apostleship, but that also demonstrate the fact that he, as an apostle, has the right or the liberty, if you will, to receive his financial support and his sustenance from those to whom he is ministering. And the first argument that he uses is this. Other apostles the brothers of the Lord, James and Jude, and even Cephas, Peter himself, they all receive when they minister food and drink and financial support. They even receive enough to support not only themselves, but, but their wife who travels with them. And he says, look, is it just me and Barnabas who don't have the right to do that? Are, are, are we the only ones who are excluded from that? He's making the case by example, using the other apostles as an example of the fact that as an apostle, he has the liberty, he has the right to not work at a job, a, you know, a secular job, but to focus all of his efforts and energy upon prayer and teaching the word of God. He has that right, and he uses them as an example. He then goes on, to give an example from human customs, from tradition here in verse seven. He says, whoever goes to war at his own expense, right? If you're a soldier 
you are equipped by the government that is sending you, right? I, I was in, how many of y'all were in the military? M many of you were in the military, right? When you were in the military, did you ever have to buy anything pertaining to your job for yourself? Now, don't get me wrong. If you didn't want to have to spit shine your shoes and you preferred the nice chloroflam, the chloroframs, is that what they call them? Do they still call them that? Chloroframs is what they call them that don't need to be shined, that have that patent leather look all the time, you had to buy those your own, at least when I was in. But when you went through basic training, you were given the shoes you needed. You were given the boots you needed. You were given the BDUs, the basic daily uniforms that you needed. And if you weren't satisfied with that and you wanted nicer or extra stuff, sure, you could buy your own. But when you went to war, you didn't have to go out and buy your own M16. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, they wouldn't let you do that, right? You had to use the equipment that was given to you. And this was not something that is unique to us. This was the practice. And, and Paul says, whoever goes to war at his own expense. And then he moves on from using the example of a soldier to using the example of a farmer who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit. Doesn't that make sense? If you are a farmer and you have planted a crop, of grapes, if you will, or of some other produce, when that harvest comes in, you are fully within your rights to partake of that which you have grown. Yes? It's just logical. And then he uses the example of a shepherd or, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock, right? If you're a soldier, if you're a farmer, if you're a shepherd, you were the first one to partake of the fruits of your labor. And he is equating ministering to the church there in Corinth with these things, being a soldier, being a farmer, being a shepherd. Do I say these things as a mere man? In other words, Paul asks the question, am I, am I just making this up? We're going to see now that he uses an example from the Old Testament law in verses 8 through 11. He says, do I say these things as a mere man or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. So you have this idea of an ox treading out the grain or an ox that's pulling maybe a grist mill, if you will, that's going around and around, crushing the grain so that the wheat can be separated from the chaff. And while the ox is grinding out that grain, periodically the ox might bend over and grab a mouthful of the grain to eat. What happens when the ox does that? It receives what? Strength, right? Nourishment, sustenance, the strength and the power that it needs to continue with the labor that it's doing. Now, a greedy farmer might say, oh, no, I don't want any of that grain to be wasted on that lousy ox. Let's muzzle that thing so that it doesn't eat any of the grain it's treading out. You do that, and what happens? The ox is not going to be able to sustain the effort because it doesn't have the fuel with which to continue working. Not only that, but the ox is the one that's doing the labor, so the ox deserves to have that sustenance and that nourishment. And so the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. It was part of the Mosaic law. Now, Paul goes on to ask the question, is it oxen God is concerned about? Or does he say it all together for our sakes? He answers his own question, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written that he who plows should plow in hope and he who threshes in hope should be a partaker of his hope. You know, we see this example manifested in a number of ways, even within our own economy, right? Um, when you work for a particular retail establishment, very often, what do they do for you? they give you an employee discount, right? Because you work here, so you deserve to have some benefit for working here. When you work at a fast food establishment, generally, not always, because some are too greedy to do this, but generally, if you're working a shift, when you have your break, what do you get? 
you get a free meal, you get an employee meal, or you get your drink for free. We see it in the corporate structures higher up through profit sharing or employee ownership of companies, right? The best companies very often have ways in which they compensate their employees by giving them a stake in the profitability of the company. When you know that the company does better when you do better, then you, and, and that you do better when the company does better, then you have a greater motivation to offer your best work, right? So these are very scriptural practices, this idea that those who are doing the work should themselves benefit from the work that is being done. And so he points out that this was even written in the law, that it wasn't oxen specifically that God was talking about, that, but these things were written for our benefit. Is it oxen again in verse 9 that God is concerned about, or does he altogether for our sake say this? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should be a partaker of his hope. Now he goes on to, to make this point very clearly as he applies it to their present situation in verse 11. He says, if we have sown spiritual things for you, is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Paul is saying, look, I have invested spiritual things in you. Is it a big deal that I should ask to receive material things in return for that spiritual investment? If we think about it, an investment in your spirit, an investment in your salvation, what is the durability of an investment like that? How long is that investment going to last? Forever, right? It is an eternal investment. The spiritual is far superior to the material, for the material is temporary. And so Paul is arguing, if I have invested eternal things in you, is it a big deal that I would request material things in response? He's like, I have this right, Paul says, and I've given you examples. There are examples of the other apostles. There are examples from the law of Moses itself. Nevertheless, he says in the second half of verse 12, nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel. Amen. Paul is bringing to a head the purpose of this illustration. He's saying, I'm, I'm not telling you all of this because I want you to give me your material goods. I'm telling you all this because I want you to understand that I have the right to ask for your material goods, but I haven't exercised that right. When I tell you that you should not exercise your liberties in such a way that it causes your brother to stumble, I don't want you to think that I'm not giving you a living example of what that looks like. Here is something that I have the right to do, receive financial compensation for the work of the ministry that I'm doing. But I have not demanded that, Paul is saying. I have not asked for that. I have not exercised that right over you. In other words, I have been willing to let go of that, which is my right, for the sake of the gospel, and you should be willing to do likewise, is his example. He goes on to give a number of additional examples using the Old Testament priests and even the command of Jesus uh, as, as evidence for his point of view. He goes on in verse 13 to say, Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things in the temple and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. So in other words, when in the Old Testament, the children of Israel would bring an offering to the tabernacle or to the temple, that animal sacrifice would be offered up to the Lord. A portion of it would be burned upon the altar. A portion of it would be given back to the one who had offered it so that they could eat it and celebrate with their family and their friends. 
and a portion of it would remain with the priests. That was the priest's portion, and that is how the priests would support themselves and their families because they weren't out sowing and reaping and harvesting grain. They weren't out farming the land. They weren't out working at a trade. They were dedicated to the service of the temple and to the offering of the sacrifices. And so they needed a way to support themselves and their families. And this was God's economy for doing that, was through the sacrificial system. And in verse 14, he goes on to point out that even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. So he says, not only do I have the example of the other apostles, not only do I have the law of Moses, not only do I have the example of the priesthood, not only do I have examples from natural law and natural practice and custom in that the soldier doesn't go to war on his own account and the farmer gets to eat of the grapes and the shepherd gets to drink of the milk. We have all these examples. All of that aside, the Lord Jesus Christ himself said this is how it was to be. And he, he gives that example. Let's take a look at a couple of points in scripture where this is, is uh, brought to light. Matthew chapter 10 is one of them. Go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 5, Jesus has selected the disciples. He's, he's identified them, and now he's sending them out. And in verse 5, we read, These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. In other words, you're not to charge anyone for this message, right? But he also says, provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts. In other words, don't take any money with you. Nor a bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor stabs. For a worker is worthy of his food. In other words, you don't need to take money with you. Don't charge anyone for the preaching of the gospel, but you can expect to be fed on your journey. The work that you do is going to justify your receiving the physical support that you need in order to carry out your mission. Turn with me again to Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, he sends out not just the 12, but now he sends out 70 of his disciples. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and he sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And then he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among the wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter first, say, Peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. And if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, nevertheless know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable in the day of Sodom than for that city, amen? And so Jesus himself made the point on more than one occasion that the worker is worthy of his wages, that the person who is ministering the gospel has the right to receive sustenance and support 
from those to whom they are ministering. Turn back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So Paul, in the first 14 verses of this chapter, has made a very clear statement that as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he has the right to expect to receive support from the churches to whom he is ministering. But now, in verse 15, he brings his point home when he says, but I have used none of these things. I haven't done any of this. These are things that I have the right to, just like you, Corinthians, have the right to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Or just as you, Christian, could say, well, I have the right to have a drink. The Bible doesn't say anything about not having a drink. It just says something about not being drunk. So I have the right to have that drink. I'm not convicted at all. Okay, fine, you're right. The Bible does teach against drunkenness and not specifically against having a drink. But if your having a drink causes someone else to stumble then should you have that drink? Or should you exercise that liberty in such a way that it causes that person to stumble? No, you shouldn't. And Paul is using himself as an example by saying, I have the right to demand that you, church in Corinth, provide financial sustenance and support for me and those who travel with me. But I haven't exercised that right. For the sake of the gospel, I have not exercised that right. Now, I don't want you to get hyper-focused on the fact that I used having a drink as an example. You could have put anything in there. You could have put, you know, the kind of television show that you watch or the kind of book that you read or uh, the kind of leisure activity that you engage in that you don't feel any qualms about at all, but that other people might. I'm not saying you cannot do those things. I'm saying that you need to be respectful and conscientious about how you engage in activities that would cause others to stumble. I think this is particularly pertinent as it pertains, pertinent as it pertains, I need to just be a little more free with that. That sounded weird. I think this is super important. How about that? As it pertains to, there's that word again, uh, social media, right? As Christians, we need to be conscientious about what we're putting out on social media. Do we as Christians have the right to argue over points of doctrine? Do we? To disagree with each other about our interpretation of a particular scripture. We do have that right. We do. Should we do that on Facebook? No, because when the world looks at us and says, well, look at those Christians, man, arguing with each other again. How can we even believe anything they have to say when they can't even agree with each other? So when you have a dispute or a disagreement, whether it's over a spiritual thing or over a personal matter with another believer, can we keep those conflicts between ourselves and not air that dirty laundry in a place that is going to bring shame to the name of Jesus Christ, right? I'll give you another example. Let's say that you feel that you have the liberty to have the occasional cigarette, right? You do not feel that it is a sin to smoke a cigarette, and so you want to do that. Should your profile picture be you puffing away on a big, should, should you do that? I mean, you might be causing, maybe there's some kid on there who's like thinking about trying cigarettes for the first time and they're like, oh, well, look there, Uncle Joe, he does it. There's nothing wrong with me doing it then. And so there they go. Look, what I'm saying is we need to be thoughtful about the example that we're setting, particularly in questionable areas where people might have different views and different consciences pertaining to such a thing and how we manifest that behavior before others. Am I talking about being hypocritical and saying, oh, well, you shouldn't do that and then secretly doing it? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about areas where you have a clear conscience regarding a particular issue. You don't feel there's anything wrong with having that hamburger that you happen to know was, was produced by some folks down at the Temple of Dionysus. You can tell because of how it's marinated. There's some wine in there, right? You don't have a problem with having that burger, but you don't need to be flaunting that liberty in such a way that's going to cause other people to stumble. And so Paul, going back to the example here in scripture, in verse 15 says, I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so to me. For it would be better for me to die than to than that anyone should make my boasting void. 
For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. And so Paul is saying, look, I didn't write these things to say, you know, okay, you need to take up a collection and send it over to me here in Ephesus, church at Corinth, because you owe me, right? And as your pastor this morning, I'm not sharing this chapter with you and I'm not teaching this to you so that you can, you know, increase my housing allowance. There, there's no need for that. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm not giving you an argument that those who, who minister should be supported by those to whom they minister so that you can put more in the agape box, which is right back there on the table <laughs> around, you know, there's also, you can give online through Tithely. That's not the reason that I'm saying those things, right? There are people out there today in the world who claim to be serving Jesus Christ, who want to profit on the gospel. That is not what Paul is suggesting. I, I always reference when I think about this back to uh, that old televangelist who I will not mention by name. But when I was a kid in high school, around the time that I graduated, maybe a little bit thereafter, this guy went on and he says, oh, the Lord told me that if I don't raise a million dollars by such and such time, he's going to take me home. And I thought, you get to go to heaven, buddy. That's awesome. <laughs> Bye. What? You know, if he didn't raise a million dollars, the Lord was going to take him home. What kind of a crazy death threat is that? If you don't give, I'm going to die, and then this ministry will be done. Listen, if that's what it's up to, then you, this ministry needs to be done, right? Okay, look, look, some straight talk about money for a moment, okay? Your giving is important. It's important to the Lord. It's important for your own spiritual health because it manifests the nature of your relationship with material things. And it's important for this ministry. What happens if you don't give? Well, if you don't give, we can't pay the rent. If you don't give, we can't pay the electricity bill. If you don't give, then I probably have to work some extra hours because that housing allowance, while nice is, you know, it, I, I could live without it if I had to, but that meant I'd have to cut back on some other services. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your giving helps carry out the things that are needful for the ministry. God knows what we need. How often do you hear me talk about giving here? Whenever it comes up in the text, that's it. We don't pass an offering plate. Does that mean that you're not supposed to give or that there isn't a spiritual principle that you should give? No, of course there is, right? Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Those who consistently give to a ministry are more invested in the life of that ministry. Those who don't generally are not. What we give our time, our talents, and our treasure to guides where our hearts are. And so if I'm investing all of my money in a bass boat, then guess where my heart is? It's in that bass boat that's sitting in my driveway that I'm working so hard I never even have time to go out on the lake for, you know? But if my heart is in the kingdom of God, then that's where I'm going to make those investments. So please understand, these principles are true, right? But I'm going to be honest with you. I absolutely love being bivocational. I could not survive on the compensation that I receive from the church. I'll guarantee you that those others who are ministering here, Michael and, and Ian, there's no way they could, you know, they, they probably couldn't put gas in their car for as little as they receive by way of compensation. But I can speak for myself and for them and say, that's not why we do this. That's not why we're here. None of us are here for the paycheck, right? None of us. We're here because we love the Lord. We're here because we love you. We're here because we want to serve. Does that mean that your giving is not important? No, your giving is very important because it's through your giving that we're able to do things like send $1,000 a month to Peru to help support the ministry there and carry on the work that's going on there. It's through things like that that tens of thousands of families were impacted during COVID because the church there was able to act as a distribution point for local food banks, and they were able to provide food for people. You had a hand in doing that. Your giving is important, but that's not the reason that I'm preaching this message, and that's not the reason that Paul was giving this message to the Corinthians. 
The reason he was giving this message was because he wanted them to recognize that sometimes it's more important to set aside what you want, need, or desire for the benefit of others and for the kingdom of God. Amen? That was his point. And so again, in verse 15, he says, I have used none of these things, nor have I written these things that it should be done so for me. For it would be better for me to die than that anyone should make my boasting void. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. In other words, I have to preach the gospel. God has laid that upon me. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I've been entrusted with a stewardship. So again, whether it's of his own free will or against his will, it's either a reward or a stewardship that he's been entrusted with. What is my reward then? That when I preach the gospel, I may present the gospel of Christ without charge. That I may not abuse my authority in the gospel. For though I am free from all men... I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. In other words, when he was around them, he was careful not to behave in a way that would offend them because he wanted to be able to speak to them. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law, to those who are without the law, as without the law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. So Paul is saying, look, when I'm around people who wear a suit and tie to go to church, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to wear a suit and tie when I go to church. Years ago, I had a friend invite me to come to his church. He was one of the elders, and it was his particular week to be in charge of who did the opening prayer and who led the the Bible study at, at their Bible class, you know, before the service. And he invited me. He knew I was a minister. And he invited me to come and to, 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 to do the opening prayer and to teach in, in his class. And, uh, and I knew from what he had shared with me that they were a little more formal than I was used to, right? I'm wearing a polo shirt and jeans right now. And, and this is about as formal as I feel like I need to get, right? I would not show up like this at my grandma's church. I would not show up like this at either of my grandma's churches back in the day. I wouldn't show up like that today if I were visiting a church where they expect you to wear a suit and jacket. I have the liberty to wear jeans. But if I wear jeans, when I go to preach to them, they're not going to listen to me, right? And I want them to listen to me. So my desire for them to receive the ministry of the word is greater than my insistence upon my liberty to wear jeans. Does that make sense? When I am going out to lunch with someone and I know that that person is allergic to peanuts, I am not going to order the, 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 the tofu thing with all the peanut sauce on it. Why? Because I know that they might go into anaphylactic shock if I did that. Right? I, I kid you not, man, that stuff, anybody here have a peanut allergy? Anybody here know somebody who had a peanut allergy? I was in a class one time, it was a freshman high school class, and I was eating a Reese's peanut butter cup. And across the room from me, this kid looks up and he's like, I need to go to the nurse. And I'm like, why? He says, because I smell peanut. And, And that was all it took for him to begin to have, or at least think he was beginning to have, a reaction. So I have the liberty to give my kid a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch, don't I? I have that liberty, but if I know that there's a kid in their class who has a severe peanut allergy, am I going to insist upon my liberty at the risk of harming that other person? Of course not. Paul is making the same case here. Now, he goes on to say, do you not know that those who run in a race all run but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. 
And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. This idea of being temperate in all things is essentially saying, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable for me, and I will not be mastered by anything, right? There needs to be the ability within ourselves to control our own desires. Listen, if you feel you have liberty to do something, but you also don't have the commensurate self-control to limit yourself in when, where, and how you exercise that liberty, then perhaps you ought not have liberty in it because you don't have control over it. It has control over you, right? If you are so insistent upon exercising your right to do this, that, or the other, then maybe, just maybe, you need to examine yourself. Amen? Do you not know, again, verse 24, that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do not obtain a perishable crown, but we, I'm sorry, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. It was a, a crown of laurels, right? Have you ever seen those images of someone wearing like a crown of leaves? That's a laurel crown. When you would compete in their version of the Olympic games and you won, you would be given that wreath, that laurel crown. That wasn't gonna last very long, was it? It was made of leaves. It was going to deteriorate and fall apart. And yet they, they ran for that reason. But the crown that we win, Paul says, is an imperishable one. It's not going to fade away. It's not going to deteriorate. So how much more then should we exert ourselves in this race? He says, they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus. In other words, this is why I do what I do. Not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. In other words, I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm in this fight for real. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Paul is making the case for spiritual discipline in the life of the believer to be able to discipline yourself to say, though I have the liberty to do this thing, I choose not to do it for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of my brothers and sisters in Christ who might be caused to stumble if I were to partake in a way that was disrespectful or inconsiderate of their conscience. Amen? See, we're not used to that, are we? We're not used to setting aside our rights for the good of others. What we want to say is, you do you, right? I'll do me. You mind yours, I'll mind mine. And there is some truth to that. We don't need to be nosing around in other people's business. You go over to somebody's house to have dinner with them, don't be going through the cupboards to see what they got in there so that you can find out if they're violating some personal conviction that you have. But by the same token, be considerate of one another and exercise self-discipline so that we can further the gospel and not be a stumbling block to those around us. Amen? Amen. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. If you can't find Philippians, it's in that section of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Go eat popcorn for those of you that need a mnemonic device. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 7, actually. Actually, no, we'll start, yeah, start in verse 7. Ah, we'll start in verse 1. I have time. <laughs> Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Now he's not talking about literal dogs, right? He's talking about people that he is comparing to dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. So he's talking about the Judaizers who often were coming after him 
telling people that they needed to observe the law in order to truly be saved, that they needed to be circumcised in order to truly be followers of Jesus, that they essentially had to become Jewish in order to be a Christian. And so Paul is saying, don't, don't submit to that. Don't succumb to that. He says, if anyone has the right to boast, he says, I'm more so, right? For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised on the eighth, eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So in other words, Paul was saying, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. If anyone else can boast in how well they kept the law, I could boast even more than them. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. See, that's what Paul was talking about, running that race. He's like, look, I'm not there yet. I haven't reached the finish line yet, but I am pressing on so that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So Paul is making this point. Look, all things being equal, there is nothing better than running the race for Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul is saying, listen, I am not running this race for a perishable crown. I'm running this race because I'm going to receive an imperishable crown. I'm not just out here shadow boxing. This isn't a fake fight. This is the real deal. We are engaged in a contest and we need to run in such a manner that we may win the prize, Paul is saying. We are answering the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's why he would say in Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through three, that since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us weigh aside every weight and that sin that so easily besets us. In other words, that weight is anything that would hinder my race, anything that would hinder me in my pursuit of God. It may not even be a sin. It's just something that isn't helping me draw closer to God, but is actually holding me back from drawing closer to God, right? So Paul is saying, we lay aside that weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I cannot run the race that is set before you and you cannot run the race that is set before me. And you say, well, wait a second. Um, if we're all following Jesus, then aren't we all running the same race? The answer is yes and no. We are all running the same race in that we're all aiming toward the same destination, but we are not running the same race in that we didn't all start in the same place. Do you see what I'm saying? If I start here and you start over there, then you are running a different race than me. You're running the race that is set before you, but we're both looking to Jesus Christ as the author and the finisher of our faith. So I shouldn't judge you because of the obstacles that are in your path. And you shouldn't judge me for the obstacles that are in my path. But we do want to make sure that we're both headed in the same direction. 
that we're both following the same master, that we are both striving toward the same goal. Amen? Amen. And so just because I'm over here running and I don't have the obstacles you do, and I say, well, I have the liberty to run like this, and you're like, but I don't. I need to not throw more obstacles in your path. And you need to not throw more obstacles in my path. Amen? But we need to exercise self-control so that when we have the liberty that we want to exercise, we do so responsibly and not in a manner that is going to cause other people to stumble. And that's what Paul meant when he says, to the Jew, I was a Jew. To those under the law, I was under the law. To those who were, were freed of the law, I was freed of the law. In other words, Paul tailored his approach to the needs of the people to whom he was ministering in that particular instance. Not worrying about his own predilections and preferences, but caring more about what they needed so that he could minister to them. Amen? It comes down to this. Consider others before you demand your own rights. Because yes, you have that liberty, but let's always exercise our liberty in love. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.